I welcome members to the 14th meeting in 2015 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and as always ask members to switch off mobile phones please. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed that the committee takes agenda item six in private. This is consideration of a draft report on the Delegated Powers provisions contained in the Carers Scotland Bill at stage one. Now we agree to take item six in private please. Okay. Thank you. Agenda item two, instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Enhanced Enforcement Areas Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015 at draft, nor on the Equality Act 2010 Specific Duties Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 at draft. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item three, instruments subject to negative procedure. The Firefighters Pension Schemes Amendment Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 141. Regulation 22D in inserting new paragraph 38 in part 3C of Schedule 2 to the Firefighters Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015 appears to be defectively drafted. Paragraph 38.2B determines the date on which a member is taken to join the new pension scheme where they decide not to appeal against refusal of an ill health award under the Firefighters Pension Scheme 1992 as set out in Schedule 2 to the Firefighters Pension Scheme Order 1992. It does so with reference to the expiry of 28 days from the date on which the member received the last of the documents which the authority is required to supply under Rule H24 of the 1992 scheme. Rule H24 of the 1992 scheme, as it applies in Scotland, does not require the fire authority to provide any documents, although the equivalent rule in England and Wales does require the relevant authority to do so. In the absence of a requirement under the Scottish rules to supply documents, the provision does not give effect to the apparent policy of objecting, of, of establishing the alternative of two dates on which a member is taken to join the new scheme in circumstances where the member decides not to appeal against refusal of an ill health award under the 1992 scheme. Regulation 26I2, which amends Rule 9 of the new Firefighters Pension Scheme Scotland as set out in Schedule 1 to the Firefighters Pension Scheme Scotland Order 2007, the NFPS hereafter, regarding commutation of pensions, also appears to be defectively drafted. Provision inserts new paragraph 1A in Rule 9, as acknowledged by the Scottish Government, the wording of the text to be inserted in new paragraph 1A does not make sense. The meaning of the provision is accordingly unclear and it does not deliver the intended policy objective. Regulation 34B, insofar as it inserts new rule B1A3B in the 1992 scheme, again appears to be defectively drafted. As acknowledged by the Scottish Government, the wording of the text to be inserted as new rule B1A3B does not make sense. The meaning of the provision is accordingly unclear and does not deliver the intended policy objective. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground I, as it appears to be defectively drafted? Yes, sir. Um, I'm distressed, I think is probably as good a word as any, at the inadequate quality of the drafting of this particular uh, instrument. Um, and I'm distressed particularly in that I understand informally uh, that uh, the problems described thus far, and I think you're going to speak of others, uh, are in some senses patent. In other words, senses don't make sense, so it's not something requiring enormous legal skills to spot that sort of error. Uh, and in relation to the cross-references I understand again that this is a comparatively, um, albeit legally trained and experienced, uh, skill to establish that these cross-references um, don't work. So we're not talking necessarily here about great uh, uh, legal principles being difficult here and requiring to be engaged in uh, detecting that there are errors in what is a very important piece of legislation for people who are getting pensions. Um, now, I absolutely acknowledge um, that the timescale over which this is, uh, had to be dealt with has been set by others uh, and has presented significant challenges. But I think it demonstrates in coming to the committee and coming to Parliament in its form here 
and with the substantial amount that we're going to be saying about it, that the drafting and checking processes that the Scottish Government is adopting in relation to this are wholly inadequate for purpose. And I think whatever else we say, and we have to agree with the proposition you're putting to us, and I'm going to do that, uh, we should nonetheless think very carefully as a committee about what we want to say to the Government uh, overall uh, on, on this uh, particular um, instrument uh, and uh, its approach to, to dealing with it, because it's not been at all satisfactory. Well, thank, thank you for those comments. John, could I, just, could I just observe that I do have quite a lot of detail to go through, and I'm thinking it would be go good to get through that, if I may. Maybe we could have a general discussion, um, perhaps at the end of Absolutely that, fine. as to how yeah. we handle that. Are, are you comfortable with that? Yes. Thank you. That would be helpful. Right. Furthermore, as members have indicated, the meaning of Regulation 7, which amends Regulation 59.2 of the principal regulations, is lacking in clarity. The amendment does not indicate whether or not the sum referred to in new Regulation 59.2BA is to be included in the calculation referred to in Regulation 59.2. The intended effect of the new subparagraph BA is accordingly unclear. The meaning of Regulation 38A1 which inserts new subparagraph AB in Rule F21 of the 1992 scheme is also lacking in clarity. The word or is included at the end of the new paragraph AB instead of the intended word and. The use of the word or rather than and indicates the period of service mentioned in the new subparagraph AB is to be regarded as an alternative to one or more of the periods of service mentioned in paragraph, subparagraphs A, B or and C of paragraph 1. However, the apparent policy intention is that each period of service mentioned in the existing paragraph 1, including the period of new subparagraph AB, is to be calculated cumulatively. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instruments of the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground H as the meaning of regulations 7 and 38A1 could be clearer? Thank you. There are also three matters the committee may wish to report under the general reporting ground. Firstly, Regulation 9 amends Regulation 65 of the principal regulations by substituting paragraph 3. Substituted subparagraph 3A refers to entitlements to payment of a lower tier ill health pension under Rule 22 of the NFPS. There are several rules, number 22, in various parts of the NFPS, at least two of which refer to entitlement to lower tier ill health pension. The omission of the words of Part 3 after Rule 2.2 is a drafting error. Secondly, Regulation 22D inserts paragraphs 26 and 28 in New Part 3B of Schedule 2 to the principal regulations. Paragraph 26.3 refers to a bereavement pension payable to a spouse or civil partner under Rule E8 of the 1992 scheme, while Paragraph 28.2 refers to a bereavement pension pay payable to an eligible child under Rule E8A, of the 1992 scheme. These references have been included in error. Rule E8 of the 1992 scheme, as it has effect in Scotland, does not make provision for bereavement pensions, while Rule E8A has no effect in Scotland at all. Provisions have effect in England and Wales only. The references to bereavement pensions in paragraphs 26.3 and 28.2 of the principal regulations are accordingly unnecessary. Thirdly, and finally, the instrument contains a number of minor drafting errors which have been identified by the committee's legal advisers. In paragraphs 6 to 8 of Rule 1 of Part 11 of the NFPS, as inserted by Regulation 28A2 of the instrument, the references to paragraph 33 of Schedule 2 to the 2015 regulations should be references to paragraph 32 of that schedule. In the new paragraph 2AB of Rule 2 of Part 11 of the NFPS, as inserted by Regulation 28B2 of the instrument, the reference to paragraph 33.4 of Schedule 2 to the 2015 regulations should be a reference to paragraph 32.4 of that schedule. And in Rule B1A3A of the 1992 scheme, as inserted by Regulation 34B of the instrument, the reference to paragraph 1 a of Rule B1 should be to paragraph 1B of Rule B1. 
in rule sorry in new rule b2a of the 1992 scheme as inserted by regulation 34d of the instrument the reference to regulation 65 4a of the 2015 regulations should be to regulation 65 3b of those regulations and the reference to rule b1a 3 1 of the 1992 scheme should be to rule b1a 3a of that scheme in new paragraph 1A of rule B5D of the 1992 scheme, as inserted by regulation 34H2 of the instrument, the reference to paragraph 31 of rule B1A should be to paragraph 3A of rule B1A. And finally, in new paragraphs 9, 10, 12 of rule G1 of the 1992 scheme, as inserted by regulation 39A2 of the instrument, the references to paragraph 34 of Schedule 2 to the 2015 regulations should be references to paragraph 33 of that schedule. Does the subcommittee so therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting ground on account of drafting errors in regulations 922D and the minor drafting errors identified by the legal advisers? Agree. Yes. And it gives me the opportunity to say thank you to our legal advisers for spotting all that. Convener? Just reading it out tells you something. John. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, I have to say I support uh, Stuart Stevenson's remarks in their entirety. Um, and from all that we've heard, to be frank, it's almost insulting to us as a committee that this piece of work be presented to Parliament in this way. Of course, we recognise... Uh, the difficulties in terms of timings, um, but it appears that not even the, the most minimal of effort has been made to check the policy intentions or indeed any of the detail um, which even a cursory examination would have revealed to be <laughs> problematic. It feels to me as if this committee is actually being forced to do the work that should reasonably be carried out by the Scottish Government. And I think that is not acceptable, that parliamentary resource should be being used in this way to carry out the work of, of the Government. Uh, uh, we have to consider our options here. I'm not certain what they should be. There are possibly several. But one of them would be to invite the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, who I believe has ultimate responsibility for this piece of legislation, to appear before the committee. Uh, others may wish to to have a view on that, of course, but this is one of the worst examples I think we have seen in a very long time. I'm wondering whether I could just deal with, before inviting further comments, whether I could just deal with the other issues that uh, are on my brief here. Um, the Scottish Government's response to questions on the instruments from our legal advisers, which happens in the normal way, of course, <coughs> states that they will deal with identified errors by way of an amending instrument with retrospective effect as from the 1st of April 2015. Uh, the committee may, however, consider that it's unclear from the response which of the points raised by our legal advisers are actually accepted by the Scottish Government as identified errors, and therefore invite the committee to agree to urge the Scottish Government to amend all the errors reported by the committee under reporting grounds IH and the general reporting ground with a respect retrospective effect uh, as from the 1st of April. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, a few other thoughts which we might note as uh, issues arising from the Scottish Government's response. Firstly, there are various references in the response to the fact the same errors appear in the equivalent regulations applying to England and Wales. Secondly, the Scottish Government is able to confirm <coughs> uh, the meaning of various provisions in the Scottish regulation, regulations and refers to the, UK, sorry, the relevant UK department on the issue. And thirdly, in some cases, the Scottish regulations simply copy over amendments relating to provisions which have effect in England and Wales and not in Scotland, as previously uh, discussed. Uh, I think all of that indicates that we are looking at regulations which did come from Westminster, which has ultimate responsibility for this, um, and which simply needed to be transposed into Scots law. Um, are there any other comments that members wish to make as to how we might proceed? Stuart? I, th I think the, the bottom line is that greater care is required, particularly in complex areas, and I I think this is properly uh, a pretty complex 
uh, provision that has to, has to be brought forward here. And I think what we need to hear from the government is what additional steps it is putting in the, their processes to minimise the errors, preferably eliminate the errors uh, that are being picked up by this committee. We are, we are, we are the last possible safety net in this whole process before the courts. Um, and the fact that we pick up such manifest errors, such large numbers of errors, such errors as could be relatively straightforwardly checked in terms of cross-referencing um, is something to which the, the government needs to turn its mind as to how it's going to stop this. Now, the government might come along and say this is the last of these such instruments because we've had a, a, a whole series of these. If so, that will give them the time to put in processes that means next time they have to engage with us. They're not going to uh, find themselves in the same difficulties. Now, of course, we would wish to support the government absolutely in making sure that there is greater amount of time for the government to do such processes as it requires. But at the end of the day, they've got to do it right, however little time there may be in which to do it. And that means they've got to look to the processes, and we as a committee should certainly write to them and make that point most mm -hmm. robustly and reserve the right, if we're not satisfied with the response thereafter, uh, to consider what further actions we might take, including, uh, as John Scott referred to, perhaps having the responsible member of the government appear before us to explain what they're seeking to do. But I think in the first instance, we should certainly look to right and ask for that explanation as to how they're going to step up the quality of their processes to improve the quality of what we get. Okay. Uh, there's a failure of process here. We're not seeking to really cast aspersions or blame. We're only wanting the process to work um, and for the Parliament to be presented with um, instruments that have reasonably been considered by the government um, before they reach us notwithstanding all the difficulties that the government has to overcome in that regard. But nonetheless, that's not a problem for us. That's a problem for the government. And I, I, like Stuart Stevenson, I would like to hear how this is going to be addressed in future. Any other comments? I, I agree with both of them. Yep, thank you. Right. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that we do start by writing I think that what needs to be said has, is already on the record. I don't think I, I, I need to add to that. Um, and I suppose we do have an opportunity here, given that there will be a new Westminster government, regardless of its politics. Um, so the new one will be able to reflect on the processes which it wants to bring in, and it won't actually be responsible for what we have before us because it was a previous government. Sense. Um, that's, that's, that's not argue the politics of that, but the point is that institutionally the light, that it will have changed. Um, um, the the, the committee makes a, a very important point there, and I think one of the, the duties to good governance in the round is we would probably want to be assured that these errors, which we can't say with certainty, but certainly it looks as if it's the case, are ones which will adversely affect English, well, legislation that applies elsewhere in the UK. Um, we need to be satisfied, I think, that they become aware of what our officials and our committee has been made aware of. Um, I, I think that may be a question of the presiding officer uh, writing to the UK government, because I understand that's protocol, or otherwise, and I'm not, I'm not there. But I think, I think you know, having, having got to the point where we've established the Scottish legislation is defective, and the inference that the UK legislation, for which we are not responsible, may be similarly defective. I think it's good, good behaviour for us to make sure that message gets back to those who can fix it. Yep. That's the point very much. John, did you, you don't want to comment? No, no, no OK. I think, I think Stuart makes a very good point. Um, and as a matter of courtesy, it would only be a kindness on our part to perhaps point out the weaknesses of the legislation as we have found it, um, given that it appears to have been um, transmitted to us in this committee yep. in, in its entirety uh, in the way that it left Westminster 
Um, and there is a, a warning, certainly for us here in Scotland, um, about doing that in future. With regard to your comments, convener, about a change of government, and of course there may be a change of government, or there may not be, uh, and we're not suggesting anything about that, but the point is that will it it probably not necessarily be a change of drafters or civil servants, no. uh, and therefore it is fundamentally not about the government, but about the process that we are concerned uh, and, indeed, and I'm right with you. Uh, that was not meant to be a political comment. Uh, I do recognise it will be the same drafters, but clearly they are working under instructions and the process does require mm. a political leadership there as it does here. Yes. Um, and that is clearly part of the problem because they're working to a 21-day rule and we're working to a 28-day rule and it's the wrong way around. Um, yes, yeah. Convener, if I may, I don't think we should get too bogged down about the 21-28 day. That, that, that's an issue. They have a timetable, and without our having rigorously sought to identify fitness for purpose in UK legislative terms, we appear to be of a view that it's very likely to be defective, and their 21 days that they had available, they would appear uh, not to have used correctly. So I think, you know, it's not about the 21, 28 days, it's just about you know, I, I could drop into unparliamentary language at the drop of a hat. Please, on please don't. We, we all know enough about processes to. to, to. Yes. OK. I th does that provide an adequate discussion of those? Thank you. Well, I go immediately straight on to the Police Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015 142, which is rather shorter. The drafting of the instrument is defective in that Regulation 66.3 does not include, in error, an equivalent to subparagraph D of Regulation 76.3 of the Police Pensions Regulations 2015, which introduced the counterpart Police Pension Scheme in England and Wales. The effect of this error is that Regulation 66.3 does not set out in full the basis on which a selected medical practitioner must decide that a member of the scheme is permanently medically unfit for engaging in any regular employment. The regulation should include a provision requiring the practitioner to decide whether the inability is likely to continue until normal pension age or death. The Scottish Government has agreed to address this point by way of an amending instrument with retrospective effect as from the 1st of April 2015. Notwithstanding that, does the committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground I, as it appears to be defectively drafted? Agreed. Yes. Thank you. The instrument also contains a number of minor drafting errors. In Regulation 1321, the, the word pension should be added after adults. In Regulation 1375, the reference to paragraph 3 should be to paragraph 4. In Regulation 149, 4A, the reference to Regulation 159 should be to Regulation 150. In Regulation 171, the reference to Regulation 176, sorry, 174, should be to Regulation 166. In Regulation 1983, the reference to Regulation 115 should be to Regulation 215. And in Schedule 1, Paragraph 1, the reference to Regulation 97 in subparagraph D of the definition of medical decision should be to Regulation 96. Although the government, Scottish Government has confirmed that these points will be addressed by way of an amending instrument with retrospective effect as from the 1st of April 2015, does the committee also agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting ground on account of the aforementioned drafting errors? Agreed. Thank you. As was with the case with SSI's 2015 140 and 2015 143, which were considered by the committee last week, this instrument and SSI 2015 141, which the committee had just considered, were laid on the 26th of March 2015 and came into force on the 1st of April 2015. The very short period of time between laying of those instruments and the coming into force has meant that there has been no opportunity for scrutiny of the instruments to take place prior to them coming into force. Does the committee therefore agree to draw both instruments SSI 2015 141 and SSI 2015 142 to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground J as they fail to comply with the re requirements of section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010? Yes. yes. Thank you. The committee may consider this breach of the 28.2 day rule. It raises again a broader issue about the timetabling of instruments which are prepared and laid in parallel with UK instruments which make similar provision. The committee reiterates the point that there is a clear need for projects of this nature to be planned in a way which allows for the procedural requirements of both parliaments to be met. 
although noting again the Minister for Parliamentary Business has undertaken in recent correspondence with the Committee to review the processes for laying instruments in these circumstances and to take steps to improve awareness within the, Scottish gov sorry, the UK Government of the challenges involved. The Committee may again wish to express its dissatisfa dissatisfaction that has not yet been achieved. I think probably we've already made that point. Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Common Agricultural Policy Non-IACS Support Schemes Appeal Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 SI 2015-167, nor the Fireman's Pension Scheme Amendment Number 2 Scotland Order 2015 SSI 2015-173, and nor on the Police Pensions Amendment Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-174. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Okay. Agenda item four is inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill. The purpose of this item is for the committees to consider the delegated powers in the bill at stage one. The members have seen the delegated powers memorandum and the briefing paper. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the Scottish Government on the delegated powers in the bill. It suggested these questions are raised in written correspondence. The committee will have the opportunity to consider the responses at a future meeting before the draft report is then considered. Section 34.1 confers wide powers on the Court of Session to make rules by act of sederant to regulate A, the practice and procedure to be followed at fatal accident inquiries, FAIs, in the Sheriff Court, and B, matters which are incidental or ancillary to such FAIs. Section 7 of the 1976 Act currently confers power on the Lord Advocate to make rules about FAIs. Section 34 of the Bill widens this rulemaking powers, these rulemaking powers, pardon me, and confers them on the Court of Session. Subsection 3 of Section 34.1 provides that an act of sedarent under subsection 1 may, be, may make incidental, supplemental, consequential, transitional, transitory, or saving provision, and different provision for different purposes. In the context of providing a broad discretion to the court in re to regulate inquiry practice and procedure without parliamentary interference, but also to respect matters properly reserved to the legislator and ministers, does the committee agree to ask Scottish ministers to explain, one, the limits of the power in section 34.1b to make provision for or about any matter incidental and ancillary to an inquiry, Two, whether such power permits the court to make provision in relation to matters other than procedure and practice in inquiry proceedings, including issues of substance relating to inquiry proceedings. And three, the interaction between the power in section 34.1b and the power in section 34.3, and in particular, why the court requires the power in section 34.3 to make provision which is incidental or supplemental to matters which are in themselves incidental or ancillary to inquiries. Yeah. Um, convener, we've uh, we've had some of this discussion previously, and I think um, while I'm content to uh, allow this to go through without uh, too much comment, I suspect uh, that this is the sort of thing that Parliament in future, our successors in office, uh, should uh, tuck away as perhaps suitable for post-legislative scrutiny once it's seen how this actually pans out and these powers uh, which we are we are highlighting uh, are actually exercised in practice so putting that on the record for future generations are, are we agreed to ask those questions though about yes we, we are thank you right that brings us to agenda item five which is apologies scotland bill the, the bill contains one delegated power set out in section 2.3 of the bill, which permits the Scottish ministers to modify the list of civil proceedings which are accepted from the effect of the bill. The power enables additions to be made to the list of exceptions for an exception to be removed or for the description of the exception to be adjusted. The, that power is subject to the affirmative procedure. Does the committee agree to report to the parliament that is satisfied with the taking of the power in section 2.3 and that the affirmative procedure is appropriate. Agreed. I do. Thank you. If there are no other comments, that completes agenda item five, and I move this meeting into private. Thank you.